Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about error handling. Specifically, I want to answer a question from Mudhole Creation, who asks, I'd love to hear how you versus the industry do error handling. Do you check parameters before you send them or do you check them in the function they're sent to? Do you not use things like raw pointers so you don't have to do checks? Using printer trace functions, what about using asserts, exceptions, try catches? Also, what are your thoughts on rules like not having, not using raw pointers, globals, or reinventing the wheel? Okay, mud hole. These are good questions. There's a whole bunch of good questions. The very first thing you should do is probably watch the video I recently posted. I think it was yesterday. I'm losing track when I don't do these every day. On frustrations in game programming. I'll link it below. Because that covers a number of things that tend to happen to programmers that make them go, err, but not specifically error handling. I'm just, I'm lumping error handling in because when I get to the end, you'll see that there were some issues with error handling I never found a solution to, or I should, I should say, I found multiple solutions to, but I could never get the programming team to agree on which one to use. It, they were pretty evenly split. So let's talk about a lot of things you, talk, you, you asked. First of all, Parameter checking. Yes, I do those. Um, I usually do those inside of the function that is called the receiving function. Why? Well, it's the receiving function that cares about those parameters the most. There are some calling functions that they received a parameter only to pass it on to you. They didn't create the parameter. They don't check it because they don't use it. They just send it right on to you because you're going to give them a value they do care about. Also, that means instead of lots of checks all throughout the code, everywhere maybe a object pointer is created or a value is, is, is created, and rather than check those in all those places, I'll just place it in one place, the function that's actually caring about it, because you can always add a breakpoint and then look up the call stack to see where where that value came from, who was responsible for creating it, why it was wrong. So I usually try to put as few checks in by putting them in bottleneck locations. Um, when I do those checks, I, I use asserts. I've used exception handling, I've used try and catch. I've also sometimes just used if then, you know, like if this pointer is null, then print, hey, there's a problem here. Um, you shouldn't have done this. Because I can wrap that whole thing around a pragma that gets removed in the release mode. Which, let me tell you two things. First of all, pragmas are great for C++. You can use whatever preprocessor directive your language supports. Just... As long as the idea is, let's get rid of this in release code because by the time you release the game, it's too late to do anything. If someone gets past a null pointer for an object that has to not be null, there's very little you can do at that point. Now, this is one of the several places people have disagreed. Some people are like, yeah, but if it crashes, and I'm like, well, you'd like to think the code won't crash because of it, but you don't want to certainly, you certainly don't, aren't going to throw in a message or anything about it. And frequently, even if you don't crash, you can't continue. Let's say someone tells you to load a game and you call the function and one of the first things it does is, um, this is an invalid file handle. What is it supposed to do? It can't load anything. It's not like you can continue. In that case, yeah, print something and be done with it. But in a lot of cases, you're checking things for being out of bounds or whatever and you can throw that away in release because it slows you down in release. Similarly, anything that prints a message out for a game developer or does some kind of trace, a call stack, emit, emit a call stack trace, or put something out in the console, things that basically aren't intended to be user facing, I wrap all those up in fragments as well and they get thrown away in release. All they do is if they stick around, all they're gonna do is do checks that the end user can't do anything about and slow down your release code. So I tend to do things like that. Um, global variables. I frequently see in academia, people are like, you shouldn't use global variables. You're a bad person if you do. These are the same people who go, you should never have a singleton class. And bafflingly, I wonder if any of them have really written code that was put into production. 
And, I, and here's why. Sometimes you do need a global. Sometimes you do need singleton classes. I There are so many games I've written where you need a class that handles save games or a class that gives you like creature objects or prop objects. It generates them. The class generates and manages those class of objects, but you don't need a multiple versions of that management class. So singleton classes exist, global variables exist. However, sometimes instead of globals, I like to use accessor functions. So the variable isn't exposed. It you, you call a get and set function inside it. C sharp people know what I'm talking about. The reason I do this is if you ever want to put breakpoints on the use of those variables, it's a little slower to use get and set. So there are times where for speed reasons, you expose a global because you're like, I can't slow down in this loop to call the overhead of a method. But sometimes you want to use a get and set so you can easily put a breakpoint on, hey, who's, who's setting this variable to null or Who's setting this to zero or who's setting this variable to out of range? You can put a breakpoint on the set function and find out rather than find everywhere in your code that that global is manipulated and set and put breakpoints there. Again, it's the try to funnel it. Um, now, a lot of modern compilers say you can put a breakpoint on something and say, show me when the memory at this location changes. And that's a perfectly fine way of doing it. Just know that it will slow down when you run the game. So if you're trying to do that in 10 or 15 variables, it's gonna slow down the run. Maybe it's acceptable. Maybe it slows down so much like, gee, if I just had a get and set function, it'd be so much easier. Or make a get and set function for it and put it all in there and then make those inline methods. Um, a lot of compilers will do that for you when you optimize. If you have a one line method, it will go ahead and inline it for you. Great. Understand what your optimization flags are doing though before you use them. Um, raw pointers. Again, I'm going to sound like a cuckoo clock here. Sometimes you need raw pointers for speed. You just need them. However, like I mentioned in my frustration video, sometimes you want to use handles instead. A handle is basically a pointer that the handle itself can't be accessed. You instead say unlock this handle and you're returned a pointer and then you can use the pointer and then you lock it again when you're done. What's great about handles is not only again does it let you put a breakpoint in one location to see who is changing this pointer or where's this pointer being used because you you can see you, you can see when it's unlocked um you can put a breakpoint there going if i ever unlock a handle and return this pointer break but it does oh and also it has the side effect of um if you want to ever get uh, memory uh, moved around or defragmented you know it's safe to do to move a block of memory. If no current handle is unlocked that points to that block, you can move that block anywhere you want. And then the next time it gets unlocked, it'll point to the new block. The downside is, is we'll open you up to bugs where there will be a code path where the lock gets called, but the unlock never does. Maybe, maybe it gets locked at the beginning of a function and unlocked at the end, but then there's an early out on that function. And you're like, oops, it didn't unlock that. And then you end up with a pointer that's locked down and a memory block that can't be moved for no good reason. So you gotta watch that. Um, so I probably have the same answer for reinventing the wheel. Um, it is very nice to use libraries like the standard 10 bit library for vectors and maps and hashes and lists and things you just don't want to constantly rewrite every single time you make your game. Um, and it's the same thing with game engines. It's nice to use a game engine. You're like, oh, I don't have to write another renderer. I don't have to write another, you know, pathing system. That's nice. But just keep in mind, you don't have any control over them. It's nice to use them, it will speed you up, but some of them don't even provide you source. So if you run into a bug, you're often, you often will lose time going, is this a bug on my end? Am, or am I using it wrong? Or is it a bug on their end? I'm doing everything right and it's happening to them. If you have the source, at least you can dig into theirs, but you will spend a lot of time trying to find out where that bug is happening and how you're gonna fix it. Um, so all I can tell you is if you're going to use something like STL or you're going to use a game engine or you're going to use any third party library, whether it's sound or, um, cinematic movie playing or whatever, you have to balance the time it would take you to roll your own versus the time you're save if you use theirs 
but then have to try to figure out where bugs are. Are they in your code or their code? This is something the programming lead and the seniors will have to figure out because it's it's unique by game. Um, we had a lot of arguments on one of the games I made about whether to use the standard template library. And the reason was that particular STL library, or I shouldn't say library because that's what the L is, that particular STL did not come with code. And one of the principal programmers was worried about efficiency and bugs. And because we couldn't see the code, we didn't know how things were implemented. So we literally had no control over that. But he did some measurements and he found that some of the implementations for some basic data structures were horrifically inefficient, especially the way we were going to use them. So you might want to check your standard template library before you just start using it willy nilly. Similarly, there was one other area where we could never we have error handling where I could never get a team of programmers to agree on what to do. And that is, what do you do when you're error handling and you find a really serious error? Like, like if you didn't check this, it would either crash or really prevent you from going on, or it would it would cause such a serious issue that something in the game would just not look right anymore or would not function right. Like some a, a creature would not be spawned or wouldn't be able to move or wouldn't be able to attack, something serious. Now, there were two groups of programmers for this. Some say, print a message and halt. The game cannot continue. Anyone using this version is going to stop, see an error message come out going, hey, this serious error just happened, go find a programmer. Or do you print, hey, uh, I was supposed to spawn a creature here and I couldn't, just so you know. Or, hey, I just spawned this creature, but he can't move. Just so you know, um, and go find go find a programmer. Sometimes you can even write when you're writing it. You know who's responsible for if this error ever happens. That means Bob gave me a bad object pointer. Go see Bob. Um, now, I had so many programming meetings where we would discuss whether to print and halt or print and continue. And here are the, there were good arguments on both sides. Um, the halt people said, "Hey." It makes it very obvious that this bug has happened. It is a serious bug. If you, it will get it, not only get it fixed, but if you continue running, it will lead to a lot of uh, errors being thrown into the Jira bug database that don't really exist. People will say, hey, the quest took me to this cave, but it, was, the, the, it wasn't there. Or, hey, the quest took me to this cave, but the monster wouldn't fight me. Yes, because you just saw an error message about it, but they don't care. They write up the bug anyway. Um, and maybe they should, you know, they saw a bug, they'll write it up. They can even reference that error. But then the problem is you fix that error and you have to go in and remove all those. Now, the flip side is if you want to continue, um, let the thing, let the print that merry message continue, you get those bugs, but it lets other people do work. If somebody's like, hey, I was walking by this cave, I didn't even go in it. But because something was supposed to be outside the gate cave holding a spear and he didn't spawn, my game halted. So I can't even walk down the road to the quest I wanted to do because I get too close to this cave. It comes into my area of interest, however you define where you spawn things in around the player. And the game halts. So great. I can't test anything because of this stupid bug. Wow. This, I would say this... Um, discussion, this split of my programming group of whether to print a message and continue or print a message and halt when an error occurred was probably up there with using standard template library as completely divided the team in two. For the STL, what we finally ended up doing was we, we used one that we had the source code for and we looked at it and we warned some people about which ones were inefficient, which, uh, data structures and methods were available that were inefficient under certain circumstances. And they say, now that we've told you, you're responsible for it, for knowing that. For the print a message, uh, halt and continue, what we did was um, early on, we printed and halted to try to get all those errors fixed. Later, we, did, we switched to print and continue and we let the team know, okay, from now on, you're gonna see some error messages. Once you see that error message happen, Anything having to do with that creature or object or whatever it says in that message is not valid because it did not, it was not created correctly. It's not being used correctly. 
whatever the error message is. So we have to we have to handle that error, but errors that that are child errors from that, we're not going to pay attention. Thanks, Windows. And I thought that was a nice balance between the two groups, and they'd both be happy. Instead, I made them both unhappy. <laughs> Instead, they were like, the ones that wanted it to halt were like, we're not halting anymore. And the ones that wanted to continue were like, hey, we should have continued from the beginning. So you will never make everybody happy. But those are the error handling techniques that I used in a majority of my games. And I think it helps. So I hope this answered your question. Mudhole creation. <laughs>